as the trial of Chad and Lori Daybell nears closer, specifically Lori in the coming weeks. We're trying to give you as much context on the case as possible. So we're going back into the archives all the way to 2020, August 3rd and 4th for the preliminary hearing of Chad Daybell, parts 1 through 13. So you can hear where it all begins in the courtroom and where it will pick up as the trial of Lori Daybell begins very soon. This is that hearing. Let's go to the courtroom. Thank you. Please be seated. We'll go back on the record. CR 2220-755, State versus DeBell. Court took a brief recess. Before the recess, there was an objection made by the state. Uh, that objection was based upon going beyond the scope of direct examination of Detective Hermosillo. Mr. Pryor responded with the argument that uh, he was inquiring into facts of the investigation. The court initially overruled the objection and stated that I would allow the questions pertaining to uh, who was spoken to, whether that conversation was recorded, when the conversation took place in the course of the investigation. I will stand by my ruling that, that I will allow Mr. Pryor to continue to inquire of the witness as to that state of the investigation. When it comes to the substance of those inve those um, interviews or inquiries of the witnesses and or family, I'm going to sustain Mr. Rob's objection going forward that uh, those will be unallowed or disallowed based upon hearsay. Uh, I think there's also a scope of the uh, the direct that would also come into play at that point. So, Mr. Pryor, if you'd like to proceed uh, with the questioning of Mr. or Detective Hermosillo on cross, you may do so. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Detective, when we were on the subject of Melanie Gibb, uh, you spoke with her as well, is that correct? That's correct. Was that a recorded conversation? Um... I think one of them, the last one was. Well, you, we, when I when I spoke with her, we were on the phone. She was in Arizona, and I was on a cell phone. Did you ever have the occasion? Now, you, I, I, my recollection, and correct me if I'm wrong, officer. I, I, my notes seem to reflect that you said you spoke with Melanie Gibb once. Was I, was I incorrect in my notes? No, I had spoken with her once in person. Oh, once in person. Okay, and that was. And then on the phone the rest of the time. So. Okay, and the date that you spoke to her in person, where, where was that location? That was in Salt Lake City. And the date of or that? Or Provo, Provo, I believe. Provo. And, and that discussion in Salt Lake City was on what date, uh, sir? Uh, I don't. I don't recall the date. Okay. All right. Now, um, you said it was Salt Lake City. It was Provo, was it not? It was Provo area, yeah. Provo area, not mm -hmm. Salt Lake City, correct. And as part of that discussion, you drove down to Salt Lake City to interview her, is that correct? That's correct. And accompanying you on that trip was Lieutenant Ball, is that correct? That's correct. And also accompanying you on that trip was Mr. Wood, is that correct? Yes, sir. And do you have any recollection of during that one-to-one face-to-face -to -face interview with between you, Mr. Wood, uh, Lieutenant Ball, and yourself, and Melanie Gibb, was that recorded at any time? Uh, I believe Lieutenant Ball had recorded that conversation. You believe or you know? I believe he recorded the conversation. Okay. You did not record it? No, sir. Who was the head investigator of this uh, investigation at this point? Uh, I was the lead investigator, okay. but he was the supervisor on scene. Okay, and as the lead investigator, you chose not to record that conversation. Is that correct? I did not record that conversation. And as the lead investigator, you chose not to record that conversation. That was an affirmative. That was an affirmative decision not to record the conversation. Objection asked and answered. I didn't Sustained. get the You can move on, Mr. Pryor. And then there was a phone conversation with Miss Gibb. Is that correct? That is correct. When was that? That was in December, sometime. Is there a reason you don't know the specific dates? In a number of instances here, we've had occasions where uh, you, you seem to suggest the month, but you don't know the specific date. Is there a reason behind that? Those weren't 
uh, super important dates to me. Uh, I, I interviewed a lot of people throughout the last eight months. Okay, and as a, as a preparation for this hearing, uh, did you um, review your reports and your, your, uh, your supplements as part of uh, your preparation to testify today? I did. Okay. And in spite of reading that supplement and refreshing your recollection, you still don't remember the specific dates and times? Sir, forgive me, I can't remember every single word for an eight-month investigation on right. dates and, and times. And with all due respect to you, sir, I'm not questioning your integrity and I'm not questioning your honesty, uh, but quite honestly, there's a lot of information here, is there not? There is. And there's a lot of things that are said as part of this investigation, is there not? There is. Okay. And I'd like to go back to the time on November 27th, I believe, or maybe, was it 26th, I'm sorry, it's November 26th, and even myself, I, I, I get dates wrong, but on November 26th, when you interviewed Mr. Uh, Daybell, you said that Mr. Daybell said he didn't know Lori Vallow very well. Is that correct? That is correct. It's not recorded, is that correct? That is correct. Is it possible that he said, I know her, and you said, how well do you know her? And he responded, well, I don't know. Objection, her. hearsay. I'm asking a question as to whether this is possible he said this. And if he's going down the road of hearsay, Judge, uh, this has already been ruled on. Your Honor, it calls for hearsay. I'm going to overrule the objection. Uh, Mr. Pryor, you, you, uh, you may continue with the question. Uh, I believe the question was, is it possible? Right. Is it possible that Mr. Daybell said, I don't know her as well as Alex? No, that's not what I remember. Okay. But, you're, but you've already acknowledged that your recollection and a number of facts may not be completely accurate. Is that correct? Objection argumentative. Sustained. Do you have a clear recollection of every statement made by every single witness in this case? Sir? Objection argumentative. I'll allow the question. Do you have a clear recollection of every statement of every witness made in this case, sir? No. Do you have a clear recollection of every date and the substance uh, and time of every date as part of your investigation in this case? Objection relevance. Mr. Pryor? It goes to his recollection. It goes to bias, Judge. I'm going to overrule the objection. You may answer the question, Mr. Detective uh, Hermosillo. Would you ask it again, please? Just the recollection of every date and time in this, in this case as part of your investigation. No, I don't. And you would agree with me that it's possible that Mr. Daybell said that I don't know her as well. Objection as asked and answered. Mr. Pryor, there's an objection as to asked and answered. Judge, I, I, I laid the foundation and went down the same road, but the question is slightly different. Is it possible that you made a mistake about whether or not Mr. Daybell stated what you claimed he stated? Mr. Wood? Your Honor, at this point, defense is clearly trying to get in a statement of his own client. That's hearsay. There's no exception for it. If he wants to get in Mr. Daybell's testimony, he can put Mr. Daybell on the stand. I'm going to sustain the objection on the ground that it's been asked and answered. I, I, I think it was asked the exact same way. I don't think he answered it in the way that you wanted him to answer it, but it has been asked and answered. Let's move on. Okay. Now, officer, your testimony pr originally was that the last time that they uh, um, saw JJ was the uh, 22nd of September. That Objection. Right? That's vague. Vague reference to they. Doesn't state who that is. Okay. So the objection is to foundation? Yes. All right. Mr. Pryor, do you want to lay a little bit more foundation before engaging in a conversation on that date? As part of your investigation, you were able to ascertain a date based on reviewing pictures and evidence of when you believe the last time J.J. Vallow was seen. Is that correct? That is correct. And as part of your testimony to you today, you said you believe that the last day was the 22nd of September. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Now, as part of your investigation, did you contact JJ's school? Yes, we did. And as part of your investigation, were you able to ascertain the last day that the school had him registered and attending school? Yes. And that was the September 23rd, was it not? That is not correct. Would it, surprise, would it surprise you to learn that there are statements about J.J. Vallow attending school on the 23rd? Initially, we talked to the school and we had an 
unexcused absence on the 23rd, but an excused absence on the 24th. So in the initial part of the investigation, we believe that JJ may have gone to school on the 23rd, but later learned that was not the case. And as part of your investigation into that uh, issue, uh, did you record that conversation with any of the officials? I did not personally speak to the school. Okay. Do you know who spoke to the school? Detective Dave Hope. Now you talked and made reference to um, hundreds of pictures and videos. Do you remember saying that? That is correct. Did you provide those hundreds of pictures and videos to the prosecuting attorney? I assume that he had gotten the photographs that we have gotten. Okay, but that wasn't the question. The question is, as you made mention of reviewing hundreds of photos and hundreds of videos. Through. Objection. I think he's misstating the, the witness's test, earlier testimony. Mr. Pryor, will you repeat the question? And Mr. Wood, if you believe he is misstating the witness's testimony, I allow you to make the objection again. Judge, the witness had previously had just said that as part of his investigation, he looked at hundreds of videos and pictures. I'm inquiring as to whether or not all of those videos, those hundreds of videos and hundreds of pictures have been provided to Mr. Wood as part of this case. I'll allow the question. I'll direct the witness to answer. During the course of the investigation, there have been numerous people that had played YouTube videos, friends that had uploaded things to the internet, things of that nature which we saw Tylee or JJ on. The videos and photographs that we had obtained, the prosecutor has copies of. Okay. But then other videos that you've used as part of your investigation that were on YouTube. And when you're talking about these videos, you're talking about people in the community who have posted videos and audio uh, who have, uh, uh, this has drawn a significant amount of local attention. Would you agree with me? I would agree. And there's been a significant amount of people posting videos, posting pictures, posting audio in Fremont and Madison County. Would you agree with that, sir? Uh, yes. Now, as part of your search warrant, um, initially to go into the, uh, and, and there were three apartments, if I have a, if my recollection is correct, and please correct me if I make a mistake. Um, there were three apartments that you sought and obtained a search warrant for, is that correct? That's correct. And the date that you sought that search warrant was when, sir? November 27th, okay. 2019. And the purpose of that search warrant was to search to determine whether or not JJ Joshua J. Vallow was present in any of those apartments. Is that correct? That's correct. Was the purpose of that search warrant to obtain information and, and, and gather evidence in other regards? No. The sole purpose was to go in there to look and see if there was a human person in any of those units. Is that correct? We were looking for any person in those units and to see if we can find out the whereabouts of JJ. Okay. Was it part of that? Did that search warrant scope include the ability to obtain and take evidence and information uh, to, to, to help support you in a later time? Yes, it did. Okay. Now, when you searched Alex's apartment, and that was 107, is that right? Alex was staying in 175. That's where his belongings were. In 175? Yes. And who was the person who owned 175, or rented 175, excuse me? On the rental agreement, I believe it was Alex Cox that was on 175. Okay, and what number was Lori Vallow's? 107. And you also went into 174, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and Mel Melanie Boudreaux's was what? 174. Okay. If I could have just a moment, Judge. You may. Mr. Pryor, if you, uh, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Pryor, 
if you do not want that to be on the record, you need to push that button right in front of the microphone there so that green light is not on while you're talking. If you hold it, you need to hold it down. Thank you. So in 175, was there any indication that Alex Cox had any belongings in there whatsoever of any kind? In 175? Yes. Yes. Okay. Were there any indications that Alex Cox was had belongings in 107? 107 was vacant. Okay. Was there any indication that Lori Vallow had ever resided in 175? Yes. Okay. Do you have a length of time as to how long she was in 175? No. Okay. Are you of the opinion that Lori Vallow and Alex Cox were living together in Unit 175 at some time? Objection calls for speculation. Do you have any personal information as part of your investigation that Lori Vallow and Alex Cox were residing together in Unit 175? I have no information that they lived there at the same time. Okay. They may have lived there at different times. In that, in that unit, is that what you're suggesting? I'm suggesting when we did the surveillance, that's where Lori Vallow was residing, and we had she located... She was residing where? In 175. Okay. All right, and we're going to get to the surveillance, so you talked about that a minute, if, if, if you may. So, um, at any point, did you, as part of your surveillance, did you see her residing in 107? No. As part of your surveillance, uh, Was there a recording of any of the surveillance tapes? No. Did you record anything? No. How many hours would you suggest you did in surveillance of the Vallow apartment 175? Fifteen, twenty hours worth, maybe. Okay. You talked about phone records initially in regards to um, the November twenty seventh inquiry. Uh, whose phone records specifically were you looking at as part of your initial investigation? Uh, Lori Vallow's and Chad Daybell's. Okay. Did you inquire as to uh, Alex Cox's phone records? Uh, I believe we did. I'm not sure if it was on the 27th or not. Okay. All right. Did you inquire as to when Lori Vallow and um, Alex Cox both moved here together? Approximately what date? Uh, yes. When was that? Uh, the 1st of September. And you made some reference to the relationship between Lori and Alex. Do you have specific information that would suggest they were had a very close relationship? Yes. And what information is that, officer? Information we had obtained through Gilbert, Arizona, through their investigation. Okay. And when Lori Vallow chose to move here on the 1st of September, um, Alex Cox at the same time moved here as well, did he not? He did. Okay. And in fact, they lived together for a portion of the time, did they not? I'm not aware of that. Okay. Is it possible that they did live together? Objection, Your Honor. I fail to see how this is relevant. There's I'll been an objection on. as to relevance. But you know, I think I'm just going to move on. I think okay. I, can, I can inquire in another banner about this evidence through another witness. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to turn our attention now to the, uh, the uh, picture or the demonstrative evidence, and I believe it's exhibit number uh, um, 10. 
And if you would be so kind again to get the, the pointer out and point where Mr. Uh, Daybell's vehicle was parked. So the court record is clear. Exhibit number 10 has remained up on an easel uh, for the entire time on cross-examination. Okay. And uh, the inquiry is about Exhibit 10 that still exists on the easel. Go now, ahead. how was the park car parked in the driveway, officer? It was backed into the driveway facing west. Okay. So the car was backed in. Uh, was it all the way to the garage or was it partially in the driveway? Sir, if you, if you look at this, was taken that morning. Okay. So that's exactly where he was parked that morning when he was sitting in the vehicle. Well, I, I appreciate you pointing that out to me. What I would like you to do is verbalize how far close to the garage was the car in relation to uh, the garage. Ten feet. So ten feet from the door of the garage towards the street, is that correct? Rough guess, yes. And Judge, may I have permission to move freely towards that exhibit? Uh, there's another pointer, I think, that's over there. Is there not, Bailiff? Is there just yeah, a... All right. If you're going to move over there, Mr. Pryor, uh, I'm, number one, I'm going to require you to wear a mask, and then number two, uh, do you plan on touching the exhibit? No, Judge, I, I, in, in light of the court's concerns, I think what I'll do is I'll try to talk this witness through this as, as well, rather than, uh, uh, and I see where the court is going, and I agree. I'll, I'll um, if I'm unable to do that, then I may uh, request that the bailiff give me another pointer, and we do it that way. I, I agree with the court. And, okay. Uh, so in regards to the uh, car being parked, and, and I will represent to you, officer, that I've been out to that house uh, probably six or seven times. How many times have you been out to the house? 15 or 20. Okay, when is the last time you were out there? Um, the last search warrant I served on the residence. Okay. Now, on that day, can you give me the date and the time, the month and the date of when you were uh, uh, doing the search again? It was in June, correct? Which search are you referring to? The search that, uh, that uh, excavated and, and removed the evidence from behind the tree and the pet cemetery. That's correct, June 9th. Okay. And on June 9th, I'm looking at that picture, and you say that's a picture taken of that uh, situation. Is that correct? Yes. And I'm looking at the tree, and the tree looks like it has foliage on it, correct? Correct. Now, when I'm in the driveway, and I'm standing, and quite honestly, I'll represent to you that I did the same thing you did. And the view to the tree back there where they found one of the remains is, is not particularly visible. So your testimony is that it Objection is that uh, he's just testifying now. The court is going to completely disregard any testimony or any information that's being provided by the, the attorney, Mr. Wood. If, if you're laying a little bit of foundation here for a question, Mr. Pryor, uh, you may do so. But, okay. But let the record reflect. I, your testimony is obviously not right. evidence. So is it still your testimony that there's a visible, visible line of sight between where the automobile was parked and that tree back in the corner where there were remains excavated? I never gave the testimony there was a clear line of sight. I simply said that he was looking towards the pond area. Oh, oh okay. So he wasn't necessarily, he looked over there. Did he look anywhere else at that point? I saw him looking towards the pond area. Okay. But the question was, did he look anywhere else? Um, I'm sure he did look okay. other places. So he was looking around, is that correct? No, sir, that's not correct. He made motions to look in different directions, is that correct? He wasn't looking as intently anywhere else as he was towards the pond area. And you can agree with me that it's somewhat alarming if someone shows up at your property and, and decides to bring a number of people to start digging up your property. Would that cause anyone concern? Yes. Okay. Now, um, I'd like to go to the, uh, 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 back to the tree behind what's called the pond area. When we're talking about the uh, excavation of the pond area, how deep down was it that the, uh, uh, the remains were found in the, in the pond area back there? I'd guess... Six, eight inches. 
Shallow. Shallow. And then in regards to the pet cemetery, how far down into the ground in the pet cemetery? I couldn't testify to that. I wasn't there when they okay. began the initial day. Uh, fair enough. And based on the 25, I'm sorry, I misstated that, didn't I? 15 trips that you took out there? Is that what you said? Yes, sir. 15 to 20? On the yes. 15 to 20 trips out there, do you have a recollection of how big that pet cemetery is? Not every trip that I made out there was to the backyard. Okay. Do you have a recollection or an estimate having been out? You've been next to the pet cemetery, correct? That's correct. And you viewed it, is that correct? That's correct. And you're trained as a police officer to, uh, to recall facts and, and uh, obtain evidence, is that correct? That's correct. So when you're looking at a site where they're exhuming a, uh, uh, evidence, it would seem fair to assume that you would have an idea about how large of an area this pet cemetery was. So can you tell me how large the pet cemetery is? I didn't worry about measuring that. That's what the FBI re recovery team was for. Now you saw a marker on the pet cemetery that marked the pet cemetery of a dog. Is that correct? A, a dog was dug up there, yes. But you saw a post and a, and like a, a, a like a monument or a picture of that's a dog, correct right and that was a that was basically a, almost like a headstone is that correct I couldn't tell you what the statue okay. was for but the, still you don't know what the statute was no what it was for oh what it was for what was it a statue of uh, I believe it was a dog okay so there's no doubt that this was a pet cemetery is that correct that's correct okay and there's no doubt that this was a uh, well-defined uh, fire pit that was back there correct Correct. This wasn't a fire pit that was created out of the blue. It was a fire pit that was well established for a significant amount of time. Would you agree with that? Objection calls for speculation. Uh, there, there's a question. If if there's speculation in the answer, I'll uh, direct the witness to to uh, not answer. But if, if the witness knows the, the answer to that question, Judge, may I redefine my my inquiry a little bit to help may. in that regard? You may. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, when you're referring to a fire pit back there. Uh, was there an actual circular area where there was a fire pit? That's correct. Was there also an area where there was numerous places where they were burning various items? Is that correct? I did not see that. Okay. All right. Now you talked a little bit about your experience in um, identifying um, human remains and that it offers a, uh, a unique smell when you see human remains. Is that, do you recall testifying about that? I didn't testify to my experience on identifying human remains. I testified to the smell of a decomposing body. Okay. And that is a very unique smell, is it not? It is. Have you ever had an occasion to smell what, it, what the smell of, of, of burning flesh smells like? No. Objection relevance. The witness never testified to that. Well, he talked about the fact that when he observed the uh, uh, the area of the pet cemetery, that he observed burned flesh and burned bones. And I think I ought to be able to inquire as to where his knowledge of making that representation comes from. Um, just so I'm clear, I, I believe that the uh, the testimony pertaining to a smell came from the first uncovering of a body, and uh, that's not the same place as the pet cemetery. So. Uh, Mr. Pryor, with that information, tell me where you're going. Judge, I just want to, um, I want to inquire, Judge, as to where he gains his knowledge of, uh, of uh, being able to identify that uh, remains were actually burned, and that rem remains were, that bones were burned, and I, I'd like to okay. know where the source of that knowledge is. So, that, so if you want to ask questions about his background on, on burned flesh or whatever else, you can do so. I'll let okay. you do that. Mr. Wood, any, any other comments? No. Do you have any experience in identifying burned, burned flesh and burned bones? Do you find experience? You mean have you been part of investigations that have involved other burned bones or other burned flesh? No. Have you ever had an occasion to smell what it's like when, a, uh, uh, when human remains are burned or scorched? Yes. Okay. And that lays off a very distinct smell, does it not? It does. 
and it's a it's a quite it's beyond pungent. It's a it's a very very easily identifiable smell when human remains are burned. Is it not? It is. And that's something that would be very noticeable if, in fact, human remains were burned. It's, it's very identifiable. And you would agree with that, would you not? Objection calls for speculation. He, Judge, he testified about his experience. I think I ought to be able to inquire as to whether it's easily identifiable. I'll allow the question. If uh, the witness knows the answer to the question, he can answer. If he does not, he can say he doesn't know. All right. Do you know whether it's easily identifiable in your experience? Freshly burned flesh? Any this, burned flesh. This had been sitting out there for quite a while, so okay. the overwhelming smell of the decomposition okay. is what I smelled. And I appreciate that, but what I'm asking you about is whether or not the smell of burning flesh is a very identifiable smell. That's right. Correct. And it's very, and, and it's not something that's easily uh, um, disguised. You would agree with that, correct? I would agree. Okay, now let's go back to the chart. And let's go back to, the, excuse me, I said chart, Judge, I want to say exhibit number 10, the demonstrative evidence. Noted. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I'll slow down, Judge. I think I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm getting a nod from our friend at the clerk saying for me to slow down. So, Madam Clerk, I will, I will pace a little better. Thank you for your patience. Uh, when I'm looking at that uh, um, aerial view, and I'd like to, you to take the pointer and put it at the front where Mr. Daybell's car is parked. Okay. Directly across the street, are there any residences? There is a resident. Do you know the owners of those residents? No, I do not. Okay. Did you interview them? I did not personally. Did anybody interview them? I can't answer to that. Okay. Now, directly across where the pond is, and we'll go to the pond and then we'll head towards the road. Is there a residence there? There is. And there's no obstruction of the view of that residence to the pond. Would you agree with that? I can't testify to that, sir. Do you see any trees that are blocking the view from that house across the street to the, to the pond? I don't. I can't see what's on the other side of the road okay. based on Fair this. enough. Fair enough. And now I'd like you to put the pointer on the pet cemetery. And from the pet cemetery, go to, to, to 1900. No, I'm sorry, go to the other street, not 1900, that street. And, I, and I'm trying to recall, and I'm sorry, I have a, my memory is, is the same thing. I'm trying to remember the name of the street. The name of the street is what? 200 North. 200 North, that's right. And across from the, the Pet Cemetery, directly across from the um, Pet Cemetery, on the other side of the street is another residence, is there not? There is. And then if you take the house and you go on the, the corner of the house that's uh, that's sticking out and almost kitty corner 200 and 1900 could you put the marker on that as well 200 and 1900 yeah, just in the very right there now if you go on the opposite side of the street there's a residence there as well is there not over here yes yes and then a kitty corner from the daybell house there's a white residence across the street as well is there not your honor i'm going to check this exceeds the scope of the uh, direct examination. We never spoke about neighbors or houses outside of the Daybell property. This is the last question I'll allow, Mr. Pryor. All right. Is there a residence kitty corner from the uh, from the Daybell residence? Where Chad's daughter lives? Is that is that where you're talking? Well, uh, thank you for that. But uh, yes, where, where Emma lived at one point? Yes, right, right down here there right. is. So if I count correctly, uh, there's one, two, three, four, five residences surrounding the Daybell residence. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Specifically, who was present at the... Uh, uh, the excavation at the pond. Do you have a recollection of who exactly was there? No, I do not. Okay. Do you have a recollection of who exactly was at the uh, pet cemetery? Not everybody. No, I do not. Do you have a, a, a broad estimate of how many people were there? Fifty. Thirty, fifty, somewhere in there. Thirty-five to fifty people? That's those, those were a combination of um, the Rexburg Police Department, 
Rexburg Police, FBI, and Fremont County. How many FBI agents do you recollect being there? I, I can't recall. I can't answer that. Did you have an occasion to interview David Warwick? We did. Was that a recorded conversation? That was the same time Melanie Gibb was interviewed. So the question was again, was that a recorded conversation? I believe it was by Lieutenant Ball. And you interviewed e Ian Pawlowski? Yes. And you interviewed Melanie Bordeaux, is that right? That's correct. And now she's going by Pawlowski, is that correct? They're married, I guess, right? Yes. Okay. And again, were those interviews recorded? They were. Okay. And Judge, if I could have just a moment to review my notes, may I? You may. Thank you, Your Honor. If you're going to speak to your client, please push that button. Judge, I think that's all I have at this point. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Wood, it is approximately five minutes to noon. Would you like to do redirect right now, or do you want to take a break right now and do redirect after lunch? Uh, Your Honor, if we do any redirect, we'll wait till after lunch. We're going to take a recess right now, then we'll reconvene at 1 p.m., and at that point we will uh, start redirect with Mr. Wood and the witness, Detective Hermosillo. We'll be back here in an hour. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. You've been listening to the preliminary hearing of Chad Daybell, parts 1 through 13. Be sure to press subscribe wherever you download podcasts so you don't miss any piece of this compelling court testimony as we prepare for the trial of Lori Daybell in the coming weeks. I'm Tony Bruschi. Stay with us.